In this video, we're going to talk about a new kind of equilibrium that describes the solubility of ionic compounds or salts. This image shown here is taken from the Nica Cave in Mexico, and it is specifically inside the giant crystal cave that was only discovered in 2000. And if you can see the humans inside the picture, you'll realize that these crystals are enormous and gigantic and just really amazing. They are some of the largest naturally known crystals in the entire world. Now, these crystals form under very special conditions. It's extremely hot and humid inside this cave. And so you'll see that the people inside have to wear protective gear, otherwise they would not survive in these harsh conditions. But these harsh conditions are what makes these single large crystals able to grow to such amazing proportions. Although these crystals are quite amazing, what they're made of is just a really boring chemical. It's a salt called gypsum or calcium sulfate. And what's relevant to the lecture today is that calcium sulfate is not a very soluble salt. And its solubility is described by this equilibrium constant, Ksp, which you can see has a very small value. So this chapter doesn't cover all salts. Some salts, like sodium chloride, are easily soluble in water. The salts in this chapter are only slightly soluble, and they are ones that do not dissociate or dissolve completely in water, like this image shown here. Now for these slightly soluble salts, the equilibrium between the solid salt and its dissolved or dissociated ions typically favors a solid. So in this reaction equation down here, which describes the dissolution of the salt, to form its dissociated ions, typically a cation and an anion, it's an equilibrium that favors the reactant or the solid. And this equilibrium constant value is quite small. So dissolution is describing this reaction moving towards the products, which are these dissolved ions. So it is the act of dissolving that salt into its dissociated parts. On the other hand, going backwards in this reaction, where you have a solution of ions that can then form a salt, this is called precipitation, where a solid can form from a solution. And if the precipitation of the solid is slow and controlled, then the solid can actually form in a highly organized structure, which we would call a crystal. Thinking about dissolution as an equilibrium process, we can focus on this reaction and write its equilibrium constant expression as we would normally like back in chapter 17. So here we have our products and the concentrations of the cation and the anion at equilibrium. And normally, we would divide this over the reactant, which would be the salt. But because the salt is a pure solid, it doesn't appear in the expression for the equilibrium constant because pure solids always have an active concentration of 1. So here, the equilibrium constant is equal to a product of the soluble ions which is why this equilibrium constant is often called the solubility product. Now, we can also write an expression for the reaction quotient, and this would look very similar to K, except that now these concentrations are not at equilibrium. And just like before, if Q is less than K, then we want to reach equilibrium, and so that means these concentrations are lower than their equilibrium concentration values. And so for Q to reach K, this reaction will move to the right to the dissolved ions, and so dissolution would occur. On the other hand, if the Q value is greater than K, then that means the concentration of these ions are higher than their equilibrium values. And so 
This reaction then would move backwards to the reactant and form the salt. And because we're forming a solid, this backwards reaction is precipitation, which would occur when Q is greater than K. The equilibrium constant that describes the solubility of these slightly soluble ionic compounds or salts is called KSP, where SP stands for solubility product. And these are describing the equilibrium between the salts and the solid forms and their dissolved ions in the water solution. So we can, again, practice writing KSP expressions. So in this first example is calcium sulfate or gypsum. And calcium, being a group 2 metal, has a positive 2 charge in its ionic form. And sulfate then would be balancing that with a 2 minus charge. For this reaction, KSP is simply a product of the calcium concentration times the sulfate concentration. And it has a measured value of 2.4 times 10 to the minus 5 at room temperature. In the second example, we have a salt, lead difluoride, that actually dissolves into three components. One of those components is the lead dication, and two of them are these fluoride anions. So I've really emphasized the two because that's important for the KSP expression, where we would write it as a product of the lead dication times the concentration of fluoride squared. And recall that this squared value directly comes from the coefficient in the balanced equation. Now this value of KSP is also quite low at 3.6 times 10 to the minus 8 at room temperature. Another measure of solubility is called the molar solubility represented by the letter S. Molar solubility is the concentration of the dissolved solid per a one liter volume that will make a saturated solution. KSP and molar solubility are directly related and oftentimes you can solve for one using the other. For many ionic compounds, both KSP and molar solubility have been experimentally measured and tabulated in tables like this one shown here. Now we're interested in this course in really understanding the relationship between KSP and S. But one thing that might be already appreciated is that the larger the KSP value, the greater the molar solubility. And that should make sense because molar solubility is really the concentration of the dissolved solid in its ion form. And KSP is the equilibrium constant value that describes the dissolution of that solid into its ions. So to really uncover this relationship, I'm going to use an example from this table here and focus on calcium hydroxide, where I'm going to use its KSP value to extract the solubility one. So here's a typical example where we're given a solid and its KSP value and asked to determine its solubility. The first thing I would do is write out the KSP reaction. And this type of question assumes that only the salt is present initially. So here would be the KSP reaction for calcium hydroxide. And so we need to first write out the products and that would be the calcium ion and two hydroxide ions. Next, we can populate the ICE table, where we begin with only the solid and zero of the ion products. Now, because we only have the reactant present and initial time, this reaction must move towards the right by dissolving some of that solid. And instead of using the variable x, I'm going to now change it to a different variable called S, which actually represents the molar solubility of these ions. So we're going to lose some amount of the solid, but it doesn't really matter because not all the solid will dissolve, so it will always be present in excess amount. But on the ion side, 
because of the coefficients 1 in front of calcium ion and 2 in front of hydroxide, we have to account for that. So plus s for calcium ion and plus 2s for the hydroxide. And then at equilibrium, we have again s and 2s for these two ion products. Now, next, we can write out the KSP reaction. And again, the solid does not appear, so it really doesn't matter what's going on in this leftmost column. But we do have to pay attention to the product ions. So we have that KSP will be equal to the calcium ion concentration times the hydroxide concentration squared. And by filling in these equilibrium parameters, we would rewrite KSP as equal to S times 2S squared, which then simplifies to 4S cubed. So from this relationship, then, we can use the KSP value to solve for S. So in this next step here, that's what we're doing. We're setting this equal to the KSP value and then solving for S, and we obtain a value of 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2. So what is this S? This S represents the concentration of the dissolved calcium ion, and 2S represents the concentration of the dissolved hydroxide. Molar solubility refers to this so-called dissolved solid, and so the dissolved calcium hydroxide is in a one-to-one -one relationship with the calcium ion and a half relationship to the amount of hydroxide ion just because of the formula. And so the dissolved solid concentration would be formally 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2. Now in all of this, this type of salt has this particular relationship between KSP and S where KSP is equal to 4S cubed. Coming back to this question, what is the relationship between KSP and molar solubility S? And the answer is, it largely depends on the number of ions present in the salt. So for calcium hydroxide, it dissociates into three components, a metal dication that would be the calcium ion, and two hydroxide monoanions. But it is not unique in having this general MX2 formula. So for instance, barium fluoride and calcium fluoride also fit in this MX2 expression. And we would derive the same KSP relationship where KSP equals four times S cubed. Now a different kind of salt would have also three ion components, but now would have a formula of M2Y. Here, it is now the anion that is two minus, and the cation is just a plus one charge, and so there would have to be two metal cations to balance out the dianion. This is exemplified in this table in the last example here, silver 2 chromate. Chromate is the 2 minus anion, and each of these silvers is a silver plus 1 cation. It doesn't matter whether the metal cation or the anion has the 2 charge, but the fact that all these three ionic compounds have three ion components would mean that deriving their KSP, we would still get the same relationship. So then that means then if we have ionic compounds that only have two ion components, then the KSP relationship would change and it does. And so for these simpler salts that are just one to one, KSP is just equal to S squared and you can also try deriving that on your own. One caveat I do want to state is that these relationships shown in the boxes are not perfect in reality. And the reason they don't work perfectly is that some salts can actually dissolve while remaining intact, meaning 
it's an assumption that they have to fully dissociate in order to dissolve in water. So in reality, the measured solubility concentrations are going to be slightly higher than those you would derive based on the KSP values. But nonetheless, using this relationship between KSP and S still gives us a very close estimate of the actual measured solubility. The solubility of ionic compounds can also be affected by external factors such as temperature, pH, and adding a common ion. So temperature does affect the value of the equilibrium constant, and I won't cover that here. But I would like to go more in depth into common ion and pH effects, which are more specific to ionic equilibria. We first heard about common ion in the buffer solutions. Basically, a common ion means that the ion that is already present in solution is the same as the ion that's added to the equilibrium. And you, by Le Chatelier's principle, the equilibrium will shift its position away from this ion. So here's an experiment that was shown in the textbook where you have lead chromate, which is not very soluble, but some of it dissolves to form lead dication and chromate dianion. And what would happen to this test tube if more chromate dianion was added? Here is the visualization of that experiment. So on the left side, we have already a reaction at equilibrium where the KSP reaction has already reached the equilibrium values for the lead and chromate ions. And then we disturb this equilibrium by adding more chromate dianion. And so in effect, what we're doing is we're increasing the concentration of the chromate um, by adding more to the solution. And what that does to the reaction quotient is that this value then would be greater than KSP. And remember, if that Q is greater than K, then you're going to favor the reaction going to the left, as indicated by this arrow down here. Another way to think about it is that to regain equilibrium, if the chromate concentration has gone up, then that means you need to decrease the lead ion concentration so that their product will be the same KSP value that it was before. So if the lead ion needs to decrease, one way of doing that is again by moving this reaction to the left and that will use up some of the lead ions as well as decreasing some of the added chromate ions. And so we can reestablish equilibrium by precipitating this ionic salt out of solution. And so what you can see at the top of this test tube are this nice precipitate of lead chromate salt. And you might notice that this precipitate is almost crystalline. It's kind of larger and shiny than the powder that was originally present. The solubility of an ionic compound might be affected by pH changes. Normally these pH changes happen by adding a strong acid or a strong base. Now the reason it might affect it is because the pH will only affect this equilibrium if the ions that are dissolved actually can undergo acid-base chemistry with the added acid or base that you give to the solution. So let's go through an example of what might happen to the solubility of calcium sulfate if hydronium ion is directly added to the solution. So calcium sulfate in its dissolved ions has a calcium ion and a sulfate ion. And sulfate ion, we would have remembered from chapter 18, is a conjugate base of a weak acid, HSO4 minus. And so that means then that the sulfate ion can actually react with the hydronium ion that's added to form HSO4 minus, its conjugate acid. 
this acid-base reaction that takes place will lower the concentration of the sulfate ions to form HSO4 minus. So that means in the solubility equilibrium, we're actually removing some of the sulfate ion product. And because we remove product, then this equilibrium will want to shift to reform more of that product. And so it will shift right. And by shifting right, that means more calcium sulfate will dissolve, which can happen by adding hydronium ions. Here's another example where we look at the solubility of another ionic compound, silver bromide. Silver bromide, when it dissolves, will form some silver plus one cation and the bromide anion. Now, neither of these ions do acid-base chemistry. Remember, bromide cannot react with water or hydronium ions to form HBr because HBr is a strong acid. And so in this solubility equilibrium, by adding hydronium ions, there is no increase in solubility the equilibrium position is not affected, and therefore pH would not have an effect.